Hi, welcome back to Conversations. I'm Bill Crystal. Very pleased to be joined today by James Carville, uh, who I've known for quite a while, who first met, I think, in 1991, 92, when he clobbered us, uh, run, helping to run, really running the Bill Clinton campaign. And I was there in the George H.W. Bush uh, White House and re-election effort. But uh, we've debated many times. We've been on the same side more recently. But most importantly, for this purpose, I think, James is one of the most uh, astute analysts, not just practitioners, not just partisans, but analysts of American politics. And I really want to get his thoughts as we speak in what, early April 2021 on where we stand, where we're, the Biden administration, the Democratic Party, what, what are the prospects for the next uh, short term, but also medium term for, for the Democratic Party, but also democracy in America and so forth. So James, thanks for being with me. Good, good. Fun so where there. are we? What's, what's, are you, you know, we, you were uh, very strongly engaged in the fight against Donald Trump, and um, but then a little disappointed, maybe by. I mean, happy that Biden won. Worried about the closeness of the election and the down ballot stuffs, but just where does the Democratic Party stand? You've been involved in uh, it and right. for a long time. Well, first thing, you know, we won the presidency in 2020 in November 2020. It's a little bit, but other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Well, the play <laughs> really wasn't very good after, <laughs> after the fact that we won. I mean. It, it, I think you'd have to call, how, how do you win the presidency? And you can say, well, we had a kind of disappointing year, but it's actually, that's really what happened. And Trump came with in, what, 42,000 votes and forced them, put them in a portion differently in four states. Uh, so I was pretty gloomy. And then January the 5th came. And lo and behold, Democrats pick up two seats in Georgia, which completely you know, the two seats heard around the world or something most significant, probably off the election or the off the election. It was non, you know, different date. And so you had that and then you had January the 6th, the insurrection. And I believe to this day and will probably believe to my dying day the most significant 24 hours in American politics was 8 p.m. Eastern, January 5th to 8 p.m. Eastern, January 6th. It, it, it just it changed the way that we looked at politics. It changed the way politics were covered. It changed just a, a, a lot of things in a country that politically doesn't change a lot. So explain that because I mean, so January fifth. Well, let's just do each of them. But let's January fifth. Obviously, the, we would be looking at a pretty different country situation now if Mitch McConnell controlled the Senate, right? Correct. And when you win the president, we went through this with Clinton and Weiss Fowler. We lost that. We had the same thing. We, we lost the runoff. What January the 5th, I mean, the difference between having, what did Mark Twain say? The difference between the nearly right, nearly right word and the right word is the difference between a lightning and a lightning bug. Right. The difference between 49 seats, 50 seats is the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. It's a really big two seats. Um, but it, it's still, it, it, it's very narrow and in, in a democratic coalition is always very, very fragile. And so you, you, you have to say, well, it was a good January the 5th and really January the 6th set them back. Uh, we'll continue to set them back because the trials and everything else, but we're, we're trying to hold this thing together with, with not very much, a little, little, you know, a little glue here and, you know, maybe a nail there, but it's, 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 it's gonna, I don't know how long this can last. <laughs> oh God, well, I thought you were cheered up now here. Now you're getting me, now you're getting uh, all Democrats, Democrats everywhere watching this are thinking, oh my God, is it that fragile? But it is, it is strikes me that it is fragile. So talk a little bit about that. But, yeah, and I think if Democrats are doing this show, no, I generally will tell them what time it is. Sometimes I'll be more optimistic about it, but I, I, I don't think any Democrat can sit here and look at this and say, wow, we took it a D. We're on our way to some. No, really. no, we could. I mean, we could, but there's a, there's a lot left to go. And, and what's really helped is the, the most damning critique of the largest government fusion of money since maybe the New Deal has been by Larry Summers. Right. <laughs> who is anything but a Republican. Yeah. But I mean, they haven't really had much to say. It's a good cancel culture. It's, you know, Biden is senile and, you know, the border's falling apart. That's about it. You know, it's some, you know, I call CBS, canceled border senility. <laughs> and, 
you know, meanwhile, they forging ahead here. Well, what about that? I mean, it, it does seem like given that you have a fairly brain dead Republican Party for now, kind of reeling from the last few years and the craziness of January 6th and the failure to repudiate at January 6th. I don't know. It seems like more people, it seems like Republicans should, Republicans do seem weak, but why aren't Democrats more able to take advantage of it? I guess I'll put it that way. Or are they taking advantage of it? And we'll just see that in a year or two that they did a pretty good job of taking advantage of it. I mean. I, I, I think when you talk, when you say Republicans, you got to think, 65%, a 75%, you know, I'll get a number, or Trump, right? They, and there's another certain percent that, that are Republicans. And, and what we found in a lot of research, and this is where the opportunity is for Democrats, that the Trump wing feels demoralized. They feel let down. That, that they actually think the election was stolen from. And some of them are even mad at Trump. But, but that they... This has been terribly demoralizing to them. Of course, they can't stand Democrats. As they're not going to be kind of available. But they, the Republicans have very difficult needle to thread here is how, you know, what you saw Lindsey Graham and everybody else going through these pretzel-like contusions to try to split the difference. That's not going to go anywhere. Uh, but I, I think if I were a any Trump Republican, I'd say the last few months have been pretty good for you. Trump is not near as big a presence as some of us would have feared. And he's still huge, but he's not drawing that big of TV ratings. He's been, you know, pretty, pretty much taken off of social media. He, you know, he can get the hardcore to go down there and perform for him at Boral Argo. But I, I, I think he is much less a force on this early to mid April than I would have thought. And I don't think there's much, and you look at these polls and 57% of the Republicans wanting to run again, that's not a very good number. Hmm. That's not a very good number. You think I, so? I, well, let's talk about the Republicans for a minute. I admit, I, met, I still want to get back to the Democrats, but <laughs> I guess I have the sort of slightly opposite inclination, which is, I don't know, everyone, every time some candidate has 57% at this stage, early as it is, who's well known and has had high office before he or she seems to win the nomination, whether it's Biden or Hillary Clinton or, you know, Romney and McCain who had lost the two previous times. Oh. And uh, there's such a tendency to, and he still dominates half the party. And so isn't he still the most likely nominee in 2024? And isn't his endorsement still going to be a huge plus for people in 2022? And doesn't that mean we still have a Trumpy Republican party? Okay, let's say, all right, say 57, you say that's not a good number. The number was 89 three months ago. Yeah. That was not going in the right direction. Yeah. And then, you know, of that 57, just something, you know. But, it, I mean, he to have a hammerlock on it like he had before, I don't think that's going to happen. Hmm. Plus, he's getting older, and he doesn't have – he doesn't have the same access. And, you know, we, we got to see where the Republicans are, but – you know, they might be where the Democrats were in 2020. Shit, let's just win. Yeah. Like, okay, this is, okay, so the guy's old. Okay, who cares? We got to win. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, he, he off the desk, he's got this. Got, nope, got to be for Biden. Because some of it, he's the one that has the best chance of winning. It, had it turned out that we would have nominated someone else, Trump would probably still be president. Yeah, I'm struck. Do you agree with that? I, I've discussed that with other people. Biden, probably the only Democrat who, who beats Trump the way things turned out in 2020? Could be. I mean, we, I mean, this defund the police was a, just a terrible drag on the Democratic Party. It really was. Yeah. And don't kid yourself. That, and then they brought Biden, but it was easy to get sucked into that. And that was had a lot to do with, with what well, we didn't do as well as we wanted to. But uh, I, I just don't be, I, I, again, I, 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 of course he's still a big presence. I just think right now he's less a presence than I would have thought in November. Well, and I, I don't see, I don't see it getting, uh, it, it, it's going to be harder for it to go up than it is to go down. It's going to be very hard. And he just doesn't have the same 
it just looks different. <laughs> Everybody does. You look, when you're president, you look a certain way. When you're not president anymore, you, you're beaten. Right. And I think he knows it. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, that, and, and look, I mean, you've always been good at this. Uh, having been in real politics, the di- it's the change that matters as much as the num- as the static, you know, photo of the number, so to speak, right? And if it's, if it's going from, as you say, 89 to 57, it can go to 47 or 37. And, and we're a long, long way away from 2022, let alone 2024. So maybe the Republican Party has more dynamism in it or less is less stuck where it is yeah. than people think, you know? I, I don't know. But I do know, let's just say we're in late 2023. And they come out with a poll and, um, you know, Nikki Haley is uh, against Biden is down one and Trump against Biden is down 11. That That's going to make an impact. Hmm. That, 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 you know, you never it sure made an impact in the Democrats in 2020. And I never believed that inside of baseball, people don't care about polls, talk about the this five E's education environment and ethics or whatever and that shit. OK, they do pay attention to the polls now. I mean, they really do. And they like you better than him. But they think him can beat them. They're going to vote for him in hmm. in large numbers and this is is a real change in american politics real change interesting why is that do you think well i i guess because of hyper partisanship people pay more and more attention to hyper partisans do and there's just nothing that motivates people in politics like winning an election and there's nothing that traumatizes people in politics more than losing an election. It sounds kind of obvious why you need me to tell you that, but that's what, what it is. And, you know, some of it is going to depend on 2022, which is a unknown. But I'm, I'm not, I think I would describe my view as Trump is a lesser, certainly the major, still the major influence in the Republican Party. But I would, I, I would say less than most other people think. So that's encouraging for me personally, and I think from my point of view for the country, but of course, if you're a Democrat, that worries you in a way, because as you just suggested, Trump might be easier to beat than a less Trumpy, you know, Nikki Haley type candidacy that's good enough for the Trump supporters, but good enough for the establishment yeah. and, you know, business types and all that. And so it get, kind of gets back to the Democrats, right? Do they, I mean, why is the coalition so fragile? What can they do better? What What are their greatest challenges? I mean, if, if Biden okay. called you and said, what, 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 two or three things could I do to really politically make right. strengthen the us going forward? What's, what's the answer on yeah. that? Right. Let's, let's talk about the, 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 the Democrats for a little bit. First of all, if Nikki Haley was good enough to keep the trunk people and bring all the business people back in the party, we would get our asses kicked. But you know, that's, <laughs> that, it's a once asked, Rodan, how do you sculpt an elephant? He said, well, it's easy. You take a piece of marble and a chisel and you take away everything that's not elephant. <laughs> all right. What's hard about that? Just getting all the Trump people and then all of the, you know, establishing Republicans to sit down and say, look, we can all be friends again. But not, you know, that, that's, that's tough. Trust the, the Democrat. We are traditionally a coalition party. We're like, what form of government in Israel? Okay, they'll take a little bit from there and a little bit from here, and we'll get the, the Arab gambling party, and then we'll take the, you, you know, the anti-settler party, and then we'll we'll, we'll kind of cobble this together for, for the sake of winning. So you end up with AOC and Joe Manchin. Now, in you know now the, the quote progressives, I don't I don't know what nomenclature to use anymore, but the leftists. I, I, term I like better. I think it's more accurate. You know, they're starting to primary these people. And so that's, you know, in, in a, by the way, we got a, a no vote margin in the Senate. When you vice president vote, we're down to four votes in the House. It's not like we have this giant juggernaut, you know, that, that is just, you know, rolling through the political landscape of America and just we're in very fragile condition. And we have a, a very fragile coalition. And within the coalition, the probably two biggest contributors to that coalition are, are, are obviously African Americans and uh, educated white women. Probably the two biggest blocks that we have in the party. 
And, you know, the, they, their interests converge in certain places, probably diverge in other places. But, in, of course, but everything else becomes necessary because you're getting, you know, a small but necessary part of, say, the white working class vote, you know, kind of pro-union vote. And you got, you know, Hispanics are definitely not monolithic and you're starting to do not very well there. Uh, so you, you, you got a lot to do. Now, specifically, there are certain things that unite the Democratic Party, if everybody likes it, like the minimum wage. Suburban educated women have nothing wrong with a $15 minimum wage. Uh, you talk about expanding health care, that, 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 that's fine. I mean, you know, any, any, I think some of this, uh, this infrastructure spending, this environmental spending, I think the college part of the coalition cares more about that. And the other thing is we found out, and this kind of helps the Democrats, at least among older African-Americans, they're pretty moderate. They don't go, they don't go for, they're not, they don't go for the shiny new thing. I mean, Warren could never connect with them. I mean, you know, Biden, it's just very few people that they know that they feel like they can relate to. And Biden just had that quality. And that's, you know, that, again, that's, criti- that's a critical part of in Democratic primaries. It's the most important constituency in the party. So, you know, it, it, we may pick up some more, you know, what happened in 2020, this analysis by this guy, David Shaw, some kind of goddamn genius. Yeah. And they pointed out that educational differences got even more profound with the more, more college educated whites being Democrat, but in less being Republican, but non-white got a little more Republican. And, you know, they, they tend to have a, a, a more populist, you know, pro-police, pro, you know, anti, I, I guess, identity politics, for lack of a better word. So, you know, it's, we got we, we to keep struggling here. And we got to struggle to keep what share we got left with these rural working class whites because they're so strategically located. You, you just can't win without a certain percentage of them. I mean, how worried are you about, you mentioned to fund the police, you know, you mentioned identity politics, uh, cancel culture, whatever you want to call these things, but how worried are you about that complex of issues? I mean, it, some of the attacks may be unfair, some may be fair, but the Democrats, parts of the Democratic Party coalition giving enough oxygen to that stuff that allows Republicans to just scream and yell about it for two years or four years and really have an effect. You think it did have an effect in 2020 down, certainly down ballot, right? The, the police it stuff. Did. And- it did. It, it is the thing that I most worry about. And because, first of all, who, who they are. I don't know of anybody, and I talked to them. I live in New Orleans, okay? It's no secret. I don't know of a single person that thinks they live in the middle of color. I really don't. I had Ed Ruben Gallego, who's a Democratic congressman from Arizona, and we did much better in Arizona than we did in Texas, Florida. He said, I, I've never heard anybody use, hear you use the word Latinx. <laughs> and that's just, it's just not the way people talk. I mean, it's not what they... You know, it's just not the way it, it, when, when people hear that. And it, it, it's a little different because when you in the middle of it, you hear it so much, it doesn't it doesn't sing out when you're out in, in the rest of the country. And the, it always it, it sounds like it was like the janitor at Smith College. I mean, that story, I, mean, I give time the, the credit for, for running the story. But, you know, there's, there is a, a feeling, and i got to tell you, I'm, I'm a supportive, ardent Democrat, passionate everything, but, but the, the English faculty at Amherst has too much power in this party. <laughs> all right? they, they really do. And they come up with all of these different things, and when people see that, it, it, they don't like it. Just because it's not what, what their life is. I think Biden does a congratulations. He stays out of that. You know, it, it, look at Florida. So you, you're, we're, we're assessing something. I said, here's, here's a state that in 2018, 64% of people that lived in the state specifically gave felons the right to vote. 
and in 2026. That was on the ballot in 2018. On the ballot, yeah. voting. People voted that way. On the ballot in 2020, it was a $15 minimum wage, which everybody in Washington says is unachievable. It passed with 60%. Maybe there's nothing wrong with the people of Florida. Maybe there's something wrong with the campaigns we run. Because if you, you're, 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 you're in an environment where almost two-thirds of the people want to give felons the right to vote, and where three-fifths of the people want the what most would consider the most extreme position of a constant democratic position, you'd say, well, that's a race that we can win in. There's nothing underlying that I see here that tells me that we can't get 50.1% in Florida, but we don't. And Nelson Diaz, who Paul talked to as the chairman of the Republican Party, said, we never mentioned in Miami-Dade, told Paul, we never mentioned Joe Biden. It was all Kamal Harris, the most liberal U.S. senator in socialism. Because all these people come from Venezuela, Cuba. And they were very effective. They, they, they left Biden totally out there. Equation, and not, you know, obviously that's gonna probably change a little bit. But Biden doesn't get involved in all this, and I, I, I think that's smart. He just, he just keeps talking about what he talks about, and I think that's smart. You could once you get drawn into it, 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 it they, they're like they never stop. They never stop. I mean, they're, they're always trying to get somebody fired. Or, you know, they're outraged at somebody all the time, and it's. It just wears I mean, people. Just wears people down. It's not even worth fooling with them. The nuts. I mean, I obviously, I think I would agree with you that if I were advising Biden, I'd tell him don't get involved. But don't some people in the party have to push back on it, or, or else it just kind of continues to erode kind of support well, as you've been saying. There's a, there's a, uh, you know, there's a race in Louisiana. It's it's April twenty fifth. It's a runoff. And it, it, it's actually going to say something. It's a 63% black district. It's a regional district. And there's a woman by the name of Karen Carter Peterson, whose dad I knew was Ken Carter, is a, uh, was chairman of the Louisiana Democratic Party within the state Senate. It's, but she's running, and she's running as the Emmys list, is the more woke candidate, et cetera, et cetera. And she's running against a, a guy named Troy Carter, who's a He's in your own city council. Who's in the state house? He's in the state senate. I think I don't know some other. In kind of what you think he is a, a good guy, nice guy. I talked to him for a long time, and you know he's running as the bread and butter. And that's going to tell you something. That that race will be at oh, it's a Democratic district. It's it's mostly black. It's in the South. That's going to say a lot because they they don't have a lot of different issue positions. Uh, but she's definitely, you know, she's got Stacey Abrams and Donna Brazil and Emily's List and, you know, all of the, all what you would expect. And, you know, Troy's got the, the mayor of Baton Rouge and, you know, the sheriff of this kind of thing. It, it's, it's uh, so, it, but it's going to be interesting to watch that race. And they're both black, both candidates are African American, right? Both black. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it, it, it's not any, it, the difference is, but it's definitely a more woke, for example, more national woke profile against a, a more kind of Jim Clyburn, you know, working in the trenches kind of profile. I mean, do you, it strikes me from the outside that, there are a lot of impressive younger Democrats in Congress, for example, a lot of the class of 2018 mm -hmm. in the House, but somehow they don't, I don't know, obviously the media loves AOC and all that, so they get all the attention and the universities get all the attention and the Amherst English Department, as you say, I don't even know if you can call it the English Department anymore, but the whatever it is, yeah, you know, World yeah. Literature Department yeah. or something. But um, I mean, is there something that could be done to help the Spanbergers and Luria's and, you know, uh, oh, oh, Alvin, Connell, Lamb, all that. I mean, this, uh, Katie, I guess it's Katie Hill, Hill man, she's good. I mean, no, they they came up that 2018 class was just stunning. I mean, I mean you're right. It, and Mickey Sherrill, I mean, just, right. they, they, they're, but what happens is, is, you know, the speakers 80 something, Hoyer's 80 something. And, there's just a lot of 
the committee chairs, there's a lot of baggage there. And they're going to have to, and I think they know this and they're pushing for it. Uh, they're going to have to do something to let this young talent sift up because they'll start losing races. Now, let me talk about AOC a second because this is the great both side of All right, James, you know, of course, we got Marjorie Taylor Greene, but you know, can't admit it, you got AOC. Well, stop. I think AOC is, you know, very savvy media wise, is a little naive about politics and what you can obtain. She kind of wants everybody to have health insurance and this kind of thing. All right. She's, to me, kind of naive and doesn't speak very well for a lot of country. Marjorie Taylor Greene is just completely nuts. Right. I mean, she, I mean, she's just completely like, I mean, you know, the raw shields and laser beams and shit and QAnon. It's not the same thing. I'm sorry. One might be a little excessive and a little media savvy and, you know, too liberal and doesn't understand. The other one is just stone ass crazy. And, uh, and by the way, she doesn't stand alone. I mean, this guy from Arizona, the, the, you know, you could name five of them off the top of your head that, uh, that are just equally as crazy. And the one that had this talent over there was Liz Cheney, because she's the one that did the recruiting. I mean, Liz saw what the Democrats did in 2018, and th they went out and recruited all of these. They didn't recruit a lot of, they recruited a lot of female candidates, you know, conservative, but they did a good job in recruiting. And they kicked our ass. But of course, now they're trying <laughs> to take the most confident person they got and exercise out the party. I think I told you, I told somebody, it's just like, we didn't have to shoot Yamamoto down. They're shooting it down themselves. They're taking the best person out. <laughs> right. Right. But it is, no, I don't look, and I, I it, but it is striking to me how little price they paid for January 6th. Kevin McCarthy votes to overturn the results in, you know, two states that were conducted totally legit by Republican governors and secretaries of state right. and, and, uh, or in the case of Georgia, at least Republicans, and I guess, I don't know, uh, Arizona, I think they vote on that too, but, and I don't know, somehow it just seems like we're just chugging along and Republican donors are giving money to the NRCC and it's like not a problem. I'm a little, I'm a little spooked by the lack of price they're paying for uh, tolerating not just Marjorie Taylor Greene, but all the people who haven't really been willing to, you know, draw any lines on the right. And also I agree with, totally with, if you talk to Republican donors, it's all like AOC is as dangerous as, as, you know, as any, as, as, as Trump, as if, you know, Joe, Joe Biden's president. Well, that doesn't matter. The party's going to be the AOC party in two years or four years. You hear that all the time from a certain kind of establishment Republican. Uh, well, first of all, it, the Democratic Party has a chance to make a stable of ourselves in the primaries of 2020. It decided very definitively. Yeah. It had its leftists and it had its liberal, whatever you want to call it, thing. and it wasn't close. It just was not close. It was like a two to one thing. And, and it was a pretty clear delineation. And, you know, it wasn't like Bernie Sanders had more money. He had, he had every debate. He was everywhere. He had every opportunity that he had. And it was clear that's not what the Democrats wanted want to do at that time is not what they wanted to do. I, um, you're right, you're right. AOC, the, the donors, you know, they, 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 they hate her. She likes it. She raises money off of it. It's kind of back and forth, but she is no way near. In her wing, that wing of the Democratic Party is much smaller than the, the nutty wing of the Republican Party. Don't kid yourself. They, there, right. As a percent of their caucus, it's way higher than, than ours. You know, I, I don't think she's, I don't think she's crazy. I don't think she, I, I just think she's kind of naive and doesn't understand politics beyond the box and fundraising, but there's nothing inherently wrong with AOC. I mean, she's active, if anything, is kind of talented. I mean, you got you to admire sometimes in some of the stuff that she pulls off. And I think she's much more talented than the, the other three in the squad or whatever else. Yeah. No, it's funny that she's become, well, not funny. She's become the face of it because she is the most talented, I suppose, but she's, yeah. she is a little caricatured in a way. And so let's, so, I mean, if, how could the Biden, could the Biden administration, they got so much to do, but could they strengthen the younger, let's call it Biden wing of the democratic party? Or is, does Biden, is Biden just a one-off 78 year old guy who, as you say, beat back with Clyburn's help, beat back the left, but, 
is there a legacy there? Or could there be? How would you do that? I, well, you know, I'm not, no, not part of the world. I'm not in it. But you hear a lot that they like a little, one of the things is it could take younger people and staff them more of them in the federal government. You know, right now they say you got to keep work for Clinton, work for Biden. They all coming I mean, for Obama. They all coming back. It's a lot of the same thing, you know. But they they could, and some everything and it's probably true because I've heard it with too many people that their hiring process is cumbersome and not 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 particularly speedy. If somebody needs to start figuring out where some young talented people are, and let's give them the baton and let's sit down and start redoing some of these committees in the House and the Senate and give some of this real young talent a chance to, to flourish. I think okay. we can do that. But but yes, in the, the party's voters skewer young, our leaders skewer old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, it's kind of crazy here. It's a youthful party with a 78-year-old president, 80-year-old speaker, and however old Schumer is. If you remember 70s. the 80s, Reagan was the most popular politician with young people. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, it. But he, but he very much tried to articulate a kind of forward-looking, optimistic yeah, doctrine. Yeah. And I guess Biden's trying to do the same thing, you could argue. He's trying to do, yes, he's, he's, he's trying to do the same thing. And, and he's, you know, what you... What, Biden does really well. He doesn't get involved in extraneous debate. It's vaccinations, it's infrastructure, it's, you know, COVID relief legislation. I, I mean, everything that he does, you know, he stays in, in his lane. And the lane that he is in is a good lane. He just, he's fine. Just stay right there. Don't, you know, don't, don't, don't get too much in the, in the culture wars because they just, going to suck you in and you probably at the end of the day what happens is we, we start out thinking we're going to win but we pay a bigger price every day every, even you, when you win you pay a price for in the culture wars because people just get bored and more resentful yeah that's what strikes me the most is that i mean he's he's had a good first 70 i think we're speaking on he's been in office almost exactly 75 days you know if you had said to us i don't know in january 1st the vaccine situation would be what it is which is pretty good the economic numbers would be good. The stock market, which presumably particularly the upper middle class types care about, has been excellent. Um, he's got a big government proposal for infrastructure and all. Some of it's too much probably and all that, but still it's not crazy and it'll get whittled down in Congress. And, and he's not imposing socialism on the economy. He's not trying to tell you that you can't go to see your doctor. He's not doing all the things. He's not defunding the police. You know, in some ways, I feel like he should be doing better than he is and the democratic party's prospects should be better than they are. And I, it makes me really, I am, I guess I'm really startled by how much the culture stuff seems to be drag, a, a drag on them because objectively you'd have to say, Whoa, this is a pretty strong first 75 days. I think. Well, first of all, I, I think what a quant would say, Bill, he's, he's 58% approval. Yeah. Right? Well, that's fair enough. <clears throat> that's astronomical in this environment. We never saw anybody above 51 since 9-11, post-9-11. Yeah. I guess that's a good point. The environment really is different from what you and I were <laughs> in in the 80s. Now, and how, yeah, we grew up and somebody, you know, you, you know, yeah, somebody would have a, approval of 74. Or some, you know what I mean? Or, or right. something like that. That, 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 that doesn't exist. I, 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 I'd say that's the kind of first thing I remember. I, I've seen a couple of polls. <clears throat> And the most important number to look for in, in when, when these polls start coming in is self-identified party ID. Because that will, that will tell you everything. So in, 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 this is worth a, just political consultant 101, two minutes. No, please. This is important, actually. Right. Yeah. So, so in, in the poll, the, in the better ones will all have a version of this. Uh, do you consider yourself a, a Republican, Democrat, now, if you add independent, you're going to get a different number. But but I, I like to, you know, we, but the way we do it, you consider yourself a Republican, Democrat, and strong, weak. And then if they say neither independent, which way do you lean? That's no, very complicated. <clears throat> if that number is higher than plus six, if it comes in about plus six, plus five Democratic, that's normal. If it goes beyond that and it stays beyond that, then that's an indication of trouble because 
people say, well, Trump still gets 85% of the Republicans. Well, 85% of 40 is a different number than 85% of 35. Yeah. And everybody yeah. focuses on that 85 and not the self-identified party ID. Now, the last two I saw had like 10 point Democratic advantages. Yeah, I saw like plus 11 or 12, you know, I think it was yeah, the last one I saw. But you know, you, you, you just, when, whenever you see a poll, just flag that part of it. I just have somebody in your office say, when, when something comes across, just send me what the, what the self-described party ID was. And that'll probably give you as much of an example because the thing that they have to worry about, them being the Republicans, is demoralization. I don't have Trump. The Democrats are just crooked. They stole everything from us. There's nothing we can do. We're doomed. <clears throat> and they're just demoralizing. And, you know, and, and we don't have Trump back, and we got this person. They got a real problem to get these people back out to vote. A, a real problem. And it's going to be a real problem when they get a $1,600 check. So... Remember that if what you want to do is, is every, everybody that you say this, they don't pay a price, James. God damn it, they do stuff that you couldn't believe and they get away <laughs> with it sometimes. Okay. Yeah, they did not, let's see, they, they lost the House, they lost the Senate, they lost the presidency. But we, should, we thought they should have lost it two to one. They didn't, but <clears throat> they got a lot of problems. <clears throat> Trust me. <clears throat> if, I scream and think about, well, we got to hold the coalition together and how, we, how can we get, you know, AOC and Joe Manchin on the same page here. They, they got their, their problems are really because they got real, real issues. No, and I think it's I guess it's and that's a good point. And I, I, I want to come back in a way to what advice you give younger people just to what to look for in polls and, and what to think about in politics as opposed to all the other extraneous stuff. But I mean, Biden won the vote, the real vote. Right. On November 3rd, the Democrats in the House won the real vote by four or five percent, let's just say. And uh, now if self-described Dem Democrats are around plus 10, that suggests that f five months later, Democrats have vaguely picked up five percent, right? Which is not nothing. I mean, in fact, in a hyper-partisan environment, it's kind of a lot. I mean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, what I'd say is say young people too, look at when you see a poll number, <clears throat> pay attention to what the last number was. So if you say the country is direction, yeah. Direction the country is 45% right, 35% wrong. So well, I don't know, that's not great. But where was it a month, two months ago? Well, it was 35% right and 45% wrong. <clears throat> well, then that's, well, okay, we're doing, it's moving in the right direction. It just doesn't, it's so simple. It, it, it's so obvious, it sounds stupid saying it, but the, when it, the better polls to these time series is, and it was always good to look at because you'll see if anything's changing in this world. Very little has changed in American politics and American public opinion, but maybe somewhat it's starting to change now. Don't know. But yeah, I, I would put it on the watch list. That's good. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, we're generally, you were famous in 92 for the three bullet points in the war room and all that. I mean, you've been good at always focusing, I think, on the stuff that matters and keeping the extraneous stuff out. What would you say? I'm leaving aside polling. So you've, you've discussed that more broadly. I mean, what would you, you know, people aren't paying huge attention. People have jobs. They're busy. They're trying to follow things, though. And what would you tell a bright young person? What, what to look for a year or two or three from now? What are the big ticket items that matter as opposed to all the chatter and talk and this and that? Well, uh, for a young person, you know, they just, by and large, they don't, they don't like Trump. Okay, I'm not being overly general. Of course, some do, but, but most... You know, they, they, his numbers are just terrible with him. And, you know, I, I would certainly talk about, you know, pick out some things that are going on that you really like and put those front and center. I mean, I, one of my big <clears throat> passions is in, when it comes to climate is, is mitigation. That, you, you, that's great. You can do all you want. But in the meantime, we, got, we need higher levels. We need better drainage systems. We need to, to raise like do what they did in Miami Beach and just literally, <coughs> you know, raise the whole thing. I mean, so, and, and you can do, and that creates jobs. It, it, it does every, it, it, it does everything. But, and if I were young and was going to be in the party, you know, you know, some people's motivation is, you know, going to be social justice warriors. 
Some people <clears throat> going to be better education. <clears throat> yeah, I, 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 I don't know, but I think that it would be an exciting time to be a young Democrat because the direction of the party is not a settled thing. Yeah. So you would be, you know, would, would be in on the, the deal as to what you wanted to accentuate and what did you want to do less. But, you know, we are, remember, a party of coalitions more than we are a party of a governing philosophy or, or something. So, so, and I'd also say that the future of the Republican coalition is not good. And this is what these companies, what's going on with Delta and Coke. <clears throat> yeah, let's talk about that a little since you were so involved and I chimed in a little bit also on the Georgia right. stuff months ago, right? So, right. So if you are marketing, so let's just say that we have a marketing firm here. And so, well, okay, we got to figure out, you know, who we want to buy a product, you know, beverages. Well, we got one, one, one side, we got a lot of white people over 65. And, you know, they're pretty fanatical. On the other side, we got like educated people, young people. <laughs> okay, what do you want to, who do you want to sell your product to? In addition to that, these companies have to be very conscious of their workforce. Because he's, it's not everybody can write code. Just get over it. All right. Not everybody can do high-end finance work. And if they get a, a bad reputation or something like that, they, don't, they, don't, they can't recruit. And it, 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 there's just a limited number of people. But so the, the companies are, in, in a way, looking out for their own interests. And their own interest is not to get downwind of the Democratic coalition. We've got to understand. It's weird that the Democratic coalition has real economic power. <coughs> It really does, because it's it's who everybody wants. Yeah, I'm struck. I mean, the Repu the right, the, the sort of Trumpy Republicans right now are enjoying attacking huge American corporations, which, you know, I'm not against some populist attacks or legitimate attacks on corporate behavior and corporate governance. And, and right. you know, they should maybe be taxed more and so forth. But it seems like a weird political strategy to take on baseball, Coke. I mean, you know, most of the country spend their time thinking that Major League Baseball and Coca-Cola and uh, are terrible entities. I don't know. It seems like a fun. So I agree on that. That seems like a crazy Republican kind of strategy, you know. I, I, I agree. I, mean, I think, you know, at some point, they, right right now, they, again, they don't have anything that they're rallying around. So anything that they can, <coughs> that they can get to unify them, they'll take it. It's just that the, these companies know that they want access to the Democratic coalition. And they don't like getting caught in this, trust me. It's the last place they want to be. CEO of Coke lives in the UK. <laughs> Imagine how much went into this decision. I'd love it on these TikToks, how did Delta decide to do this? You know, how did Coke decide? Yeah. Because it, it, they don't make these kinds of things lightly. Yeah. But nonetheless, they passed, now they passed legislation in Georgia on voting rights that's much less severe, I guess you'd say, than what was originally planned. But still, is they did pass it and they signed it into law. I mean, so which way does that cut? I mean, it shows how strong the, 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 the fierceness of the Republican determination to make voting more difficult and stuff is pretty astonishing to me, you know? Because it, well, it's not really because it, they, they know what happened. I mean, yeah. if you were a Georgia Republican for the last 20 years, did, did, January the 6th or 5th was a shock to your system. Yeah. So what they say is one day they just got up six o'clock in the morning and said, hey, we're going to write a 98 page bill that expands voting rights. Oh, sure. Yeah. They're going to pass it in the House at nine o'clock in the morning. They'll pass the Senate at noon. And then the governor and six other white guys are going to sit under a painting of a plantation and we're going to sign it and not let anybody else in the room and then say, how dare you criticize us when we were just trying to help? Yeah. <clears throat> if people just had the good sense to let these, you know, these blacks in Georgia had the good sense to let the Georgia Republicans decide what's best for them, they would be a lot better off than deciding themselves by voting because we know that the Georgia Republican Party is. <clears throat> the modern Georgia Republican Party is going to always look at the best interests of the poor and the downtrodden and the marginalized people. <laughs> and they, their argument is just, when you get to it, 
it said, yeah, it could have been worse. And we, we didn't, we, we left Sunday voting in. And I, I, I assume that they'll, at some point, they'll try to back off and say, well, you can bring people water in lines. Right. And Coke will say, well, we'll supply the water. I'm, I'm sure everybody wants to get off of this. And it, it, they should have never gotten to this. Somebody should have gone to them early. How worried are you practically, though, that there'll be enough ability to tinker with voting over the next year that it will be harder for just practically harder for Democrats to win, you know, races and swing districts and swing states. I, I worry a great deal. And I, even though the law passed, I worry a little bit less about Georgia because they're so organized and they're, they're so going to be so well financed. They, you know, the Democrats. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and particularly in Georgia. But sure, you worry, you, you know, sure, you worry about it. And, and it's a, you know, if we go back to Florida in the 64 percent, it's actually a winning political issue. That's interesting. It's actually good to talk about. That's interesting. So you don't think it sounds just like complaining or inside baseball. It's an actual uh, real uh, issue. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, even uh, everything that I look at tells me people like to expand voting rights. Yeah. And it's clear that the Republicans have made a choice. Is our, our coalition is shrinking. It's not growing. And we... We, we just have no chance of appealing to people outside of our coalition. So we got to limit it. So they just basically given up on macro messaging. Yeah. So can't do it. I mean, one thing I think you've always stressed when well, you and I have done speeches together, we both stressed is how unpredictable, contingent, fluid politics is. And the conventional wisdom is often wrong. The consensus once a consensus gels, things often break in the opposite direction. Democrats can't win the White House. So that was 1992. Electoral College locked five of the last six elections. Then the opposite, 2016, the, what was it, the blue wall? Whoops, it's not so, much, not so much of a wall. I mean, A, I'm just curious, do you think there's any particular thing the conventional wisdom is wrong about today? And B, looking backwards, you've had such an interesting career. Where, like, what were the biggest surprises? What are the biggest lessons of sort of things that happened that people didn't expect? Um, you were in that 91 race that was so important in Pennsylvania that was the precursor really to Clinton in 92, which people thought Bush and the Republicans would, you know, were strong. I, I'm just curious what generally on the kind of people, are, don't you think people, I think people are too fatalistic and too, they assume that, you know, social science can predict all these things, which I'm pretty doubtful about. Yeah, and I mean, look, there's no doubt that Poland's had a terrible, didn't have very good last two. You know, I, I love Poland. You know, I, I like posters of people, and many of them are friends of mine. And they're all trying to figure out what went wrong, too. And so there was, there's always some glee at watching expertise. You're right. You know? <laughs> it's just kind of fun to watch. It, 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 one of the things that people, of a certain thing is they, 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 they think the economy is one issue, healthcare is another issue. You have to remember the war room, the economy is stupid, don't forget healthcare. To 80% of the people in this country, and I'm just making that, I'm probably low, <coughs> they, their electoral cardiogram and their 401k is the same to, 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 to wealthy people as two different things. You, you go to the doctor, say, okay, this is where you are physically, this is your financial health. <coughs> 80% of people in the country now, their financial health is their, is their health. Wow. They get one bad diagnosis, they're done. All right, so so it, 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 it really, the, the distinction, the, the line between healthcare and the economy to most people is a very, very thin line. And, you know, they don't, poor people go to the doctor when something goes wrong. Or they go to the dentist when something goes wrong. Well, you know, it's all the consequence of that goes out. It not just it's to middle class people too. I mean, you can't do every focus group you do in Ohio, Wisconsin, if you have one disease away from bankruptcy. Well, right. bankrupt. I mean, that that's so common. It's not even no comments on it anymore. Or, or you know, lo extended care for older relatives and so forth. I mean, the degree to which right. that is the dominant financial concern, well, right? If you didn't have that, and that's part of the Medicaid, that long-term care, it'd be, it'd be terrible. But, yeah. and, but, but they don't, the Democrats don't win on that because I mean, people know that the Republicans are not going to get rid of it. They're just not. Though, yeah, mm -hmm. 
But you think you could still, I mean, they did win in 2018, I think by making, don't you think by highlighting that the Republicans would have tried yeah. to get, sort of tried to get rid of it, I guess. <laughs> so what happened is, it, 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 this is a very simple little story in 2016. People <laughs> said, well, we kind of got away from ourselves. Right, we'll recruit. And we'll just talk about, we didn't talk about Trump much in 2018. It was <clears throat> kitchen table issues, the way you want to call them. But it was pretty focused on expanding health care. Oh, that, 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 that kind of thing. And, and really good candidates, as we talked about earlier in the program, really good. In 2020, kind of went to sleep. We fell back on recruiting, let them get the best of us. Then let the whole defund the police thing get, get out of hand. Uh, the democratic debates the, were, were, some of them were not very good for people to be watching. It looked like they were just a really lefty, party that is really into identity more than my life. I, I can't, you know, it, it, it wasn't, you know, it came out fine and Biden did fine and nobody else other than Biden did all that great. And I, I think there's a, a, a real lesson underneath this. I mean, to the extent that, I mean, there were no, very few people that voted for Trump and voted for a congressional Democrat, but there are a lot of people that voted for Biden that voted for a congressional Republican. Yeah, no, that's something I, I'm struck here in Washington that the Democrats haven't quite, I mean, they were so happy to win Georgia, which I understand on January 5th, that it sort of blocked out the actual facts of November 3rd, which were minus, what was it, 12 or 13 House seats, minus the two legislative chambers, you know. Um, yeah. And but going in thinking we were going to do pretty good. Yeah, yeah, with all the polling and, and stuff. And, you know, remember, 18% of the country elects 52 senators. Yeah. Yeah, it's not going to change. That's not, <laughs> not going to change. That's not going to change. That part's not going to change. Maybe gerrymandering in the House will change a little bit, but uh, well, you could add DC and bring it up to, you know. Yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, that would be interesting. I'll let you go soon, but I mean, thank you for joining us. But any, just I'm just curious, looking backwards, any particular, if you had to, some young person who didn't know your career and didn't know American history that well from 19. I don't know, 85 to 2015, what would you, what would you say? I mean, what, what are the big, what, big lessons, big lessons of 91, 92, or just generally being a Southern liberal all those years? I mean, that's an interesting thing. Were you ever tempted to, you were, you were not tempted to switch parties, I assume. I'm like no. Zell Miller for whom you worked or Phil Graham against whom you worked and, and, and so forth. Um, no, I mean, it never was. And, and it's kind of funny, not very many of us, but there's a real bond of being a white Southern 70s liberal I mean, people, and what's and what's the key to that i'm really i'm curious oh, about that everything is right when, when i my whole view of politics when, when you know i was in the 50s growing up in south louisiana everything every discussion was about race yeah it just it just was nothing <clears throat> we had a governor's race it was all about race and i just i don't i just one day i just said you know black people get the short end of this stick and then just kind of side, it was really, it, it wasn't much more complicated than that. Uh, because there was just no, and plus I was just sick of talking about it. I just can't, you know, just talk about something else. You know, it's just anything, please. And, and of course you, you couldn't. And so that, that basically is the, in 1964, myself and two of, Two, three other guys went up to Southern, which is was at that time the largest black university in the world, and got what organized the Young Democrats. And they said, God, what was it like? What you're doing up there? You crazy? What you know? It was just it was like a <laughs> it was a foreign country almost. Uh, you know, and I tell you, somebody that's young get in politics, and I get this question a lot. If you you will know very soon if you have an act for this. And I've seen some people that like, you know, highly educated, highly intelligent that, that don't have an act for politics. I've seen, seen some that have been highly educated, highly intelligent that do have the knack. And the most important thing I would say is put yourself in a position that you have a chance to succeed. If you're gonna work on a campaign, try to find would you think would be a good one? And just be persistent in getting in where, and just, you know, 
do some research, hopefully a campaign manager, she or he or whatever the pronoun is these days, will give you a, a, a chance. But you're not going to go anywhere in this business on your own. You, you got to you got to march in, as Bob Squire says, you got to march in front of the bandstand. What about elected officials? I mean, what could they, people who are thinking of running, advice that you must get this question. I get it all the time. You must get it right. many more times. What should I do to prepare? What should I, how should I think about it? I mean, what's the trick to success? Well, okay. First of all, it's, it's, let's say you want to run. Yeah. Okay. So what's the first, first thing you do is you look at you are running for know, the state senate. Right. So you say, how many people, and again, we're going back to Rodan. We got our chisel, we got our piece of marble. Okay. But the first thing we want to chisel out is all of the people <coughs> that we know that are going to vote and we know are not going to vote for us. All right. Now we take all the people we know that are going to vote and going to vote for us. Chisel them away. All right. So then, but you, but you, so then you go to to you three buckets left: people who are a low propensity to vote and a low propensity to vote for you. People with a low propensity to vote but a high propensity to vote for you, and then the somewhat shrinking but still relevant number of people that might vote either way. And then you got to design your candidate, your campaign, with. The key group, of course, is low propensity to vote, but high propensity to vote for you. And if you can do that in a way that doesn't get the low propensity to vote, the low propensity to vote for you. You, right. you get what I'm, I'm saying? You got your different buckets here. Once you figure your buckets out, all right, once you get them figured out, then strategically you're ready to go. And I would tell anybody that's you know, running for any office is, you know, it's the Roger Mudd question. Just, you know, and, and always practice, always, always try to teach my candidates, you want the question you don't want. Hmm. You know, if they want to ask you this, if you know you, you had a, 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 a DUI when you were in college, don't say, I hope they don't answer the question. Say, I want that son of a bitch to answer the question. <clears throat> you know, we were, and, uh, Bill Scranton, Thornburg had been governor of Pennsylvania. Casey had won three times before it lost, and he was the three-time loss from Holy Cross. And Bill Scranton was, you no, know, his daddy was the governor of Pennsylvania. He was an icon of, he was actually not a terribly bad guy. It's kind of weird. And, you know, we're in a debate, and, and of course, he, he'd been saying this, and we knew it. And he said, you know, I'm, you, you're, you're three times lost from Holy Cross, and you know, you've lost a lot. And Pennsylvania is like a butterfly, it's emerging and is a new economy, and you know, with our great wealth. You know, okay, so let me tell you something. You're right, I've been on the canvas, and I've got, an, got another message for you. Sometimes the view from the canvas can be, canvas can be very educational. I know mm-hmm. a lot of people in Pennsylvania that have been knocked down, but you know what they do? They do what I do, they get back up. You've never gotten back up because you've never been knocked down. Oh, you just got knocked down right flat on your fucking ass. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Well, that's like Biden, right? Biden used, uses a version of that. He used a version yeah. of that in, in 2020. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 you teach that you want, you actually want the question that they think you don't want. Right. And how about go back one more step? So a 30-year-old, I'm 33-year-old uh, kid who served in the military maybe after college right. and uh, right. wants to go, go back home and run for office. I mean, even before his campaign, how does he even think about it? I mean, do you encourage him to look for the right district or do you just take a gamble or what's the kind of right way yeah. to think? You don't take a, I mean, first of all, you, you got to run in some district that you have some chance to win. Yeah. Okay. So you're not going to go to Matt Gates's district and if you're a Democrat and winner, you're not going to go to you know, you, so yes, you're, you have to, and look, there's nothing wrong with politics. There's nothing wrong with saying, all right, I want to do this. I'm ambitious. This is the best place I, I think I can do it. And, you know, again, no, it's no, it's no good if you don't have a path to win it. Right. So you have a path there. And then what do you want to, what do you want to talk about? What do you think it is? How do you frame the issues? And, you know, most people have a, a lot of people are motivated. They start out, okay, how do you want to help the community? Well, I want to help the community. Well, I'm interested in, in, 
you know, art education. Great. Okay. Don't tell anybody that, <laughs> you know, I, it, you, you just have to like chisel it down to w- what it is. What's your rationale. And I, in, you know, and it takes a lot of practice, a lot of asking yourself. And if they say this, if they do this, then what do we do? And how do I go about this? And, it, it, it just, it, it takes some, some discipline, but there's no like magic thing that I, anybody, need think anybody else say, well, if you do these three things, you're going to be successful. Yeah. If you do these three things, you can put yourself in a place to be successful. <clears throat> that's it. Yeah, but that's good. You can't get there unless you put, unless you give yourself a chance. Yeah. I'll let, I'll let you go in a second. What most talented political figure you've worked with? I mean, elected official? Bill Clinton. Not, not even close. Not, not. And what's the short reason? I mean, I just could pick up. His mom was like a sponge. I mean, we could do fall at eight o'clock in the morning in 10 minutes. He, he didn't, he, he knew, and plus, he's just a natural with people, natural. But even he had this thing that he thought he could, you know, it's kind of his weakness of his strength. He thought he could talk anybody into anything. I think John Brummett once said Bill Clinton could talk a dog out of a pork chop, <laughs> which, which might, there was some truth to it. But uh, but just sort of raw political talent. He's is like he's as good as anybody that I've ever worked for. Uh, but I, and I've worked for some interesting people. I, I guess the most interesting one was Columbia. You know, we had a a runoff and actually ran second in the first round and, and uh, I got a, I, I, I couldn't be there. A friend of mine was a former CIA agent. So I sent him down there and he'd write these elegant reports for what was going on on the ground in Columbia. So they, I think I'm going to put it in one of my books about how, and of course, the guy ended up winning a Nobel prize. And so how did a Nobel prize and a C, CIA agent and a Cajun guy from Louisiana end up in Bogota? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just one of these kind of <laughs> funny stories. Um, it is some of the candidates I work for, got, I, I, I mean, Bob Casey is a man I really like, really looked up to in a lot of yeah. ways. I mean, he's very, yeah. he's a very different guy. Um, Zell and I, we became closer toward the end of his life. I just, it was a lot of, a lot of good experiences, you know, some yeah. of these foreign campaigns are really fun. I love working in Israel. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we talked about that once. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, that's another. We'll have to do a whole separate conversation on. Oh, this. I don't know. BB's not going to be able to form a government, is it? I mean, every for the last five or eight years, right? Everyone has said, "Well, time is up for BB," and then he he seems to. He's the guy's kind of amazing. I mean, yes, I, I, in, in, that's one thing about Israeli politics. They're not looking for the new face. No. <laughs> not, not yet at least not yet and, and, but they, I mean they you do what well, you look around yeah they all have to do a generational transfer too, Shimon Fred, like I don't know, how long was Shimon Perez in Israeli politics like it couldn't even from the beginning he was the from last the really I guess of the founding generation but yeah. years ago. <clears throat> almost founding generation yeah. yeah it's amazing I'll let you go you got to got to help save the Democratic Party here which is important for the country and um, uh, but thank you James for joining me today and uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and we'll do it again in maybe six months and give, give the Biden administration a report card and you'll tell us what's going to happen in 2022. So that'd be great. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you. It's great. Thank you. Bye-bye. And thank you for joining us on Conversations. Bye-bye.